Hidden Histories project has a number of strands, uh, of which the oral history is one part. It's, it's partly located in archives, photographic archives, cataloguing James Revillius, James Deakin and other photographers' work. It's got a community trails part, which is linking out into the community and meeting various community groups. The oral history part itself in many ways brings the other two bits together insofar as we are very interested in the Revilius photographs. They underpin the interviews that we have, Revilius and Deakin photographs. They underpin our interviews, but we're meeting people in the community for them to tell us more about what's in the photograph. So that's the really key interest in that. It's important as for two reasons, I think, as an adjunct to particularly the brief that James Revillius originally had to capture a way of life that was passing. That's how he originally started the work in the late 60s, early 70s. And in many ways the oral history is deepening perhaps, adding to, giving a context. People are talking about that way of life. With a, with a camera and a photograph, you've got a still representation. What the oral history adds to it is people saying, my life was like this at that time, and giving detail. And I think that adds quite a lot to it. Really. I think there's a range of things. Really. The nicest part has been meeting a whole range of people who are linked to the the photographs and who have lived lives that I knew nothing about really at all before. The, the life of the of many North Devon farmers was, I suppose to put it in an odd way, was 24 7, 52 weeks of the year. They were farming to live and the life on the farm dictated their life patterns and it's quite interesting talking to people about how that panned out. Different stories of, of their time. There was one man who told me of how he lived on the farm and his village school was a mile and a half away and he'd have to cross a field, cross a brook. Then he would take his Wellingtons off and put his school shoes on to go into school. And I asked him whether anyone would steal his Wellingtons and he said no, a local farmer would look after them for him. Keep an eye. A range of things. Yes, there is the farming stuff and the farming practices, but a lot of the things that people start talking about is um, festivals. Festivals in the various communities, and I've summarised them as being sacred, secular, and seasonal. So there are a lot of festivals based around particularly or exclusively as far as I know the Christian calendar. There are um, seasonal festivals relating to um, harvest festival for example and secular festivals that occur in a number of villages. At the moment what comes to mind is the Hatherley Tar Barrel. These festivals and fairs occur in different parts of Devon at different points of the year and I'm quite interested in knowing what happens, knowing how it happens, and also trying to think what these carnivals, festivals, what they mean to the village identity, what they mean to the northern North Devon identity. I think another thing that's come up very strongly, and I'm certainly going to explore it further, is the changes in patterns of villages and village lives. Some of the people I've spoken to live in relatively small villages and they say they were, at the time that they were being brought up there were three cobblers, a cord wainer, I've learned that a cord wainer is a person that makes shoes, doesn't repair them, so you'd have cobblers and cord wainers, numbers of vegetable shops and numbers of other shops, all in a very small village. Now they've all gone, there's no shops, no, or very few shops, some villages don't even have a pub. So that change, I mean, people talk about that with sadness really, trying to understand how, what has happened to take the community 
out of the village. So I think that was an interesting thing to I think the challenge with oral history and why you should listen to it, well, why you should listen to it is it gives you a different take on what is happening in a particular area at a particular time. Written history, written policy will give you a version largely based on documents, largely based perhaps on the voice of people who have more power, people who are able to articulate this is what it was like. So oral history potentially gives people with less power an opportunity to say this is what my life was like. Why you should do it, I think being, I've always been interested in the past, in history, in the, how history makes up what, what is now, how it makes up me, how these various historical patterns and events, how have they made me what I am. So there's a, there's a bit about personal curiosity. I think there's a bit about local community curiosity and then moving outward, national curiosity, global curiosity, it fits together. I think the challenge with oral history at the start is if you are, are a researcher you need to be able to access the archive easily and that's a challenge that we're working on at the moment. How we catalogue the data, how we enable researchers to get the data they want without having to listen to 300 hours of oral history.